So it's right at one o'clock and uh, wanted to start our Facebook live session. We've been looking forward to it. Uh, we've got Liz Pike here from Green Rhino Recruiting. I know you guys have all seen that I've been talking a lot about job seekers and what people need to do. It's a tough time. A lot of people have gotten laid off, maybe had shift um, reductions or have been furloughed and have other kinds of issues due to this crisis. But we wanted to take this time to really talk about job seekers and what they can do. And I've known Liz for a long time. Um, she's been an industry expert and she owns Green Rhino Recruiting. And she is the person to go to with all of the answers about what you should do if you're a job seeker and the right kind of positions out there. Companies trust her, people trust her and work with her forever. So we definitely have her for expert advice. I'm gonna turn it over to her to give us some background and history. And then we'd love for you guys to ask a bunch of questions and get started. Awesome. Thank you, Garima. Yeah, I think we've known each other. It's got to be over 10 years. I've been in the payments and fintech industry for the past um, 14 years. And I'm a little different than most recruiters because for two of those years, I worked in the payments industry on the ISO side, um, on a high risk ISO and then a low risk ISO. And then I also worked in the fintech industry on site with a client for eight months as well. I did that so that I could get more hands-on experience in the industry. Um, but three years ago, I started my own recruitment firm. Most of the work that my team and I do is through referrals. So we work on an agency basis, which means we work with different types of fintech companies, be they startups, uh, we work with Payfax, we work with banks, we work with card networks, uh, prepaid companies, it really runs the gamut. In the last five years, I would say we're seeing much more of a surge into the fintech space. And that, in fact, that's how I got to know um, uh, Tom Aronica, who works at Biller Genie. And um, one thing that I've liked about my my role as a company owner and a recruiter is that I can be kind of selective about the clients I work with and make sure they have a good long-term culture, a good product, a good fit. I have always uh, taken it upon myself to help out candidates in whatever way I can, even if I can't place them in a job. I know that's a little different than other recruiters um, because, you know, it's we, we make our money basically off of getting paid based on putting you, the candidates, in a position. But I feel like in the fintech space, there's enough business for everyone. And the focus needs to be on not just what's the right fit for the company, but then also recognizing the candidates, people who are looking for jobs, you are people and you need resources too. Even if I can't help you out, I might know some recruiters or some hiring managers who can. So I've always had that kind of um, philosophy. And I, what I've seen in the past couple of months is that now people are really leaning into that because there's a lot of people who haven't had to look for jobs that are now thinking about that. Um, so I guess I'll just say I'm coming at this conversation as yes, the owner of a recruitment agency that focuses on fintech, but in terms of connections and the types of networks I've built, that's been all across the US in payments, fintech, banking, and other areas, IT. Um, and what I wanna do today is really help people who are either, if you're actively looking, or if you're wondering what should your next career move be, I'm not sure what my company is doing, just kind of give you some straight talk at this point. I, I'm seeing a lot of, um, positive, positive thinking things on, you know, online. And if you dream it, you can do it. And that's all great. But what I want to do here is give people some specific tools and, and then also help them to start kind of a plan to search for their career. So maybe that was a lot of me talking. No, 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 that's great. Um, no, and I think that's exactly why I wanted to make sure that we had Liz on this call because there's so much practical advice. I can tell you that I have been interviewing and hiring people for probably the past um, 17 years in different types of positions, everything from line level employees to executives. And there's so much that goes into it. And people like Liz really are the ones who are talking to those candidates first. And you can just tell when someone has been 
prepared for an interview and they know what to do kind of coming into it versus when someone just saw something and they happened to walk in. And I'm sure that the stories we can tell you about the people that we've seen or spoken to would be, um, would I'm sure be very surprising to many, many of you. And I see some fake comments on Facebook. So, hey, Raja, and I see Travis is watching. So we've got quite a few, we got a few people watching and, and talking. So that's fantastic. We're really, really excited about that. Um, if you guys have questions or if you guys want us to talk about something specific, please make sure that you interact with us. This is not supposed to be just us talking, but we're hoping that you were answering the questions. So I think the first question I have for Liz is, how do people get started? Like, what are the things that you want job seekers to know that they should start their job search with? What, what, the, what should they be doing as a whole? That's a great question. And different people are coming to the party in different places on this. There have been a lot of people who have interviewed often before this or have made some different job changes. But then there's a lot of people who haven't had to interview before or even think about brushing up their resume. And I don't want to... Um, I don't want to, you know, paint things as all flowers and rosy. What I saw in the past couple months was a kind of a complete shutdown or hold on most positions. Um, and I thought that would last for a good 60 days. And then we would see, like we did after 2008, 2009, positions on the tech side, development and product type positions come up. What I am seeing now, uh, in the past week, I've gotten four new jobs. Uh, three of those were developers. One was a technical product manager. I And I wasn't going out and cold calling for those jobs. So what this means is that a lot of um, fintech uh, things that would be happening in the next five years due to COVID-19 are happening now. What that also means is that a lot of companies in the fintech and payment space need to, either they're in a good spot and they're ramping up even more because they're getting more, uh, more clients, more merchants, or they need to pivot. So what I was initially thinking when COVID-19 happened and kind of travel got shut down, I thought, okay, we're gonna have a space of about six months where there's not much hiring. I underestimated the innovation and speed of what people are doing in the fintech space. However, you might be saying, I'm not a developer, I'm not a technical product manager, what can I do now? So here are some things that, we, that I think we just need to make really clear. A lot of companies don't have the money or just aren't using job platforms. Maybe they will use LinkedIn. But, um, but a lot of them are just posting on their website or going through their networks. However, that doesn't mean they know you personally. So the first time they're going to see you or know of your experience is on LinkedIn, um, on your resume, or through a referral. So the first things that people need to do are make, if you're in a job and you're not sure what's going to happen, if you're out of a job but you have some downtime, is to make sure not only that you have, uh, you know, the basics of LinkedIn, what you've done, a picture, keywords, but also make sure your resume is upgraded and clear and concise. And then also make sure your, this is key, your communication is, um, and, and how you present yourself is at the level that you're getting that you're that you're earning or that you want to be sometimes it's crazy to me i see people who they haven't they've been top performer in their company whether they're doing support or product or anything sales and they come to me and say liz i got laid off my company laid off 70 percent of our employees i haven't had to look for a job for 25 years and they are great at what they did but they don't do they haven't done a good job of putting that down on paper and then they're not good at selling themselves in a clear, concise manner. And people want to know what you did, when you did it, how well you did it, and how that relates to their company and culture, what the buy-in is. If you have never had to sell yourself in a short form, that can be a hard transition to make. So in addition to, um, 
to focusing on, okay, I want to make sure my LinkedIn, my resume, and my written communications are on point. Everything's spelled correctly. I'm spelling the names of people correctly. Just to show that you're that detail-oriented, capable, intelligent person. It also might make sense now if you have downtime to get some, I don't want to call it training necessarily, maybe some consulting. And that can be with higher level people, you know, that have done a lot of interviews like Garima, although C-level people often don't have a lot of time. I have partnered with a company called Career Focus Network. And, and the reason I did that is because I was getting so many candidates saying, hey, I, you know, I'm, I've got the skills for this job, but they weren't there at the interviewing and communication level. A consultant like Career Focus Network, or if you can find someone who's been SVP to C-level, has interviewed a lot of people and can take the time with you, they can help you not only communicate what, what you've accomplished and how well you've done, but also your story, how you got to where you are, who you are as a person, your business ethics, your sense of humor, and kind of communicate that in a short 20 minute to half hour time frame during an interview. A lot of recruiters, we want to do the best we can to get you in a good spot to interview. I personally, though, feel like if I train the candidate too much on what the client wants to hear, am I really finding them the best fit? So you don't necessarily want to go to a recruiter for help me out on how to interview better. Um, because one, they might just tell you what the client wants to hear, and that's not actually what you're doing. The key here is to really be authentic. And two, now is a really good time to dig in and see if you're doing what you want to do and what your next steps are. Because the downside is we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's been a lot of hiring freezes. There's a lot of uncertainty on what's going to happen next. The upside is we're not going back to exchanging, I don't know, bags of hay for potatoes. FinTech is here, it's staying here, and your skill set is important. But you need to create kind of your emotional interview level to match your skill set to get the job you want. That's, um, that's fantastic feedback because I know that on this end, I know when people come in for interviews, the first thing I do, or even when someone applies and they send a resume over to whichever the department manager and someone says it's a good, might be a good fit, I'm definitely checking their profile and their resume and all of those things that you mentioned first. And I'll say just a kind of side note on pictures. Um, I think this is a really big one. And I don't think people realize how much LinkedIn pictures or profile pictures matter, but it needs to be clean. It needs to look like who you are. Um, one thing I see a lot, and I'd love to hear your opinion on it, but I see people use their wedding photos. Um, use like a picture from, you know, where it's a guy in a tux or a woman in a fancy dress. And while that's good, um, I know my first response to that is, are they, young how how young are they <laughs> like are they you know did they is that is this why they're using this th this picture because it's the only picture they have is from their wedding um and i i definitely makes me question probably something i wouldn't question otherwise if it was just a normal picture of them outside or in an office or something else um and then the other one is when they just look like a mess in their pictures or you just pixelated and you're like we all have smartphones i mean it's not that hard to take a good photo and post it and be wearing professional clothing. And it seems surprising that that one thing gets missed. I know on this side, when I look at it, I, I'm always surprised about that. What are your thoughts on what that picture should be? So I, I have two schools of thoughts on the thought on this. And one is I try to make my picture as updated as I can and my most recent hair color so that people can recognize me and I can recognize them at trade shows and events. <laughs> um, that's like you want. Yeah, you want it to be you. The other side of it, I think some people feel like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a developer. I can have whatever I want. Or they, my wedding picture was my best picture. I would say with picture and taglines, the <laughs> it's not a dating profile. You don't need to be creative. But what people want to know is that you're a nice, normal, competent human being. And I find if it's not necessarily the picture but it's the fact that they might have that picture and then and then combined with other information that doesn't, you know, if you're a 
SVP of client management and your picture is you water skiing, that could be great, but that's not going to help me know if, um, you know, if, if you can fit in with the rest of this. So I think, yeah, I think it, it, you know, LinkedIn isn't Facebook. It's not Instagram. People just want to see your face and they want to see your most recent face. And if you have a great wedding picture, that's fantastic. I have a lot of good wedding pictures too. Um, I just, I just keep them in my house. Like I can't, don't get me wrong. I can't appreciate a good wedding picture. Absolutely. But, but yeah, that makes me think it, is this the, is this the only picture that person could do? And then how are they in terms of like technically and creative and problem solving? So to me, it would just be put on a button up, stand in front of a wall, take your picture yourself or have someone do it and text it to yourself. If someone can't do that, that's a problem. So yeah, I know people will. And and the, the um, I would say also too, if you put anything on your LinkedIn, like I'm 100% the best in the business or something like that, just to me, and I'm kind of seeing this late in the past year in terms of um, interviews, it's good to be confident. It is bad to be overconfident. So if you are saying things to the recruiter or to your friends or family, like, I don't think anyone else could get this job. I'm absolutely the best fit. You need a reality check. There's millions of people out there. You couldn't possibly know if you're the best fit. So I think it comes down to being realistic yet optimistic. You don't need to take a bad picture. And I don't know if you don't like your hair right now, you can pull one from last year. But what I'm wondering and what hiring managers are wondering is, okay, if I needed you to update your LinkedIn picture quickly or download an app so you can do a call with a client or something like that, can't, are you, so it's, it's less about the picture and more about how are you technically and are you aware of how you're representing yourself? That's such a great point. And I, I, you know, I didn't even think about that, but even look at where we are right now. I mean, everybody's working from home. Everybody's on Zoom. You have to be able to see people's faces. I mean, I know that everybody has here has probably seen all of the Zoom fails and all the memes of the person going to the bathroom by accident, the person um, not realizing that their camera was on. So I do agree with you that maybe um, that's what I'm kind of responding to. And so I think that you put it in a very concise fashion that it's about their skill set, not necessarily just that picture. It's this is not a beauty pageant or anything like that. It's just about knowing that it's a real normal person who knows how to take a picture and actually put it up. So I think that's great. Um, and then another one is the resume and getting that resume done. And you know, I know I see a lot of typos. I will say that just from a purely technical perspective figuring out where your page breaks are, you know, like people will put, I know that's, I mean, it makes you laugh because we see this all the time, right? You get a resume and it'll be, you know, everything on one page and there'll be one sentence on the next page. You're like, well, you couldn't figure out how to change your margins or how to be a little bit more concise with that term. So you didn't go into a second page with one sentence or sometimes they'll put page numbers on it and that page number two will be halfway down the second page. What gets me is the graphics. When they have a graphic of of what their skill set is, but I can't, that takes up like the whole first page or half of it, but then I can't figure out when they had that experience and, and what, how it applies to this job. And then that make the graphics make it hard to upload. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, so it's just, here's what I'll say um, about resumes. And I think all of this comes back to a bigger point too. One, don't pay a crap ton of money to get your resumes done. I have something called a candidate packet that I can go over network later when we're talking about our network, but I have sample resumes. I also have the names of two people who do good FinTech resumes at a relatively cheap price. Um, two, your resume, just like your LinkedIn, just like your interview, it, it's all part of a bigger picture. So, um, and I think people don't understand how little time people spend reading resumes. Like they glance at it and they might read bullet points, but if you have big paragraphs of things, that's hard to, I mean, that was hard 10 years ago. It's especially hard now in our, in our kind of scrolling world where we're used to seeing things in a bullet point manner. So I will say with resumes, it is important that everything is spelled right. It is important that you're at the level that you need. Do not feel like you need to, um, to pay someone a lot of money 
I, I can provide samples. There are samples online, but also understand that when people are looking at your resume, there are keywords that go along with whatever job you are interviewing for. So if it's, um, you know, client manager working with uh, clients that are banks specifically, if it's um, a sales role working with ISV partnerships, if it's a product role working on a cross-border payments platform, you want to make sure those keywords, that ISV, banks, whatever it is, are up at the top of the resume so people see that first. There's a good way you can like write core competencies and put it in a bullet point and stuff like that. But I think people are thinking that someone's taking their resume and then sitting down with a cup of tea and then leisurely looking through it. And that's not what's happening. No. What's happening is recruiters, hiring managers, or HR people are glancing at your resume. If you're lucky, it's a hiring manager or a recruiter who knows fintech terms and can understand it. But I, I mean, I would just say it's all part of the package. And I think something people need to do now is start looking at this like a long-term plan. Um, I, I had a leadership training years ago and I talked about making goals and then breaking those goals into monthly, weekly, and daily steps. And there's several components of this plan, which includes LinkedIn, resume, probably talking to someone about how you interview. I, on my candidate packet, I have a list of long interview questions, um, but it's helpful to get a consultant in there. And then also knowing what kind of jobs you want to target. So I think if you can create kind of a long-term plan focused on those areas and start with targeting your resume and LinkedIn, and then looking at jobs you want, you can then take it from there to applying to those jobs and leaning into your network to get connections and interviewing when things start picking up, which I thought was going to be in six months, but might, but might be more like in two. Yeah. Um, I know that we're, you know, interviewing, I know you and I talked about that and hiring people. And I think you're so right about it being the bullet points, because I know when I get a resume, I'm looking at two, maybe three things, if that, um, about that person. And I'm also more interested in what you tell me. So if I'm working with you, Liz, and you know, obviously we've known each other for so long, I'm more interested in what you are telling me in terms of feedback about that person. And I'm just looking at that resume to make sure, can they spell the words that I need them to be able to spell? Is it the right format? Do I understand? Do How long have they been at jobs? And I think also, in terms of the interview prep, which I think is kind of the next part of this is how do people do that better? Because a lot of times what they say in the interview or even what they say in the first, second, third, fourth interview, none of that matches. Like they're saying different things to different people in the organization and maybe it's nerves, maybe it's something else, but that definitely is a major red flag um, for me. And I think the other thing is not being able to explain things on your resume. So especially in fintech, I know we see a lot of things move quickly. We see mergers, acquisitions. You might've been one company for six months and it was bought by another company and that company didn't need as many people. And those things happen. So sometimes the resumes look maybe a little choppy and maybe someone is concerned or worried about that. And I think that that's a valid concern, but if you know how to answer that question and you actually understand that that's going to be a question. Like it's, if you were at a job, if you were at every job, the last four jobs for six months or a year, or even two years, it's going to be a question. So really knowing how to answer those things and also um, being consistent with those answers, I would say is kind of a pet peeve or important thing for me. But I think we have someone who has a question for you. So Raja said, he's always gained traction and interest when he's applying for jobs. He had two contract IT management roles, but finished his last position in October of last year. This time around, he only had one success in the second interview, which went dead because of COVID-19. He's not getting any traction. What would be the three or four most important points that uh, you could help our friend Raja with? Okay, so um, I'll say, I'll say a couple things here. Um, and is Raja, do we know if he's on the tech side? We don't. Um, well, it says that he was a contract IT management. So I would okay. assume yes. Okay. okay, perfect. So here's what I want to talk about leaning into um, your network. And I, I agree with you on pet peeves. I think another pet peeve that a lot of, um, that a lot of companies will say is this candidate had no questions on the job or the company. And maybe the reason the candidate didn't have any questions is because the last five interviews they went through that day, 
answered those questions. But the point is you still need to, you can't just show that you're qualified for the position. You have to explain to the company why you feel you're a match at what you can bring, but also what excites you about the company. I will also say on people jumping around or having a lot of job changes, that has happened in the fintech industry and happens a lot. But what really matters is the energy and the level of emotional investment, the person, the the candidate has on that. I've seen a job go sour where they were going to give an offer and the candidate said, well, I'm kind of surprised you didn't ask me about my job jumps. And then they, then they started asking and then they thought now those jumps were easily explained by things like reduction in forces, private equity companies taking over, et cetera. But, but that is to the point of, I would challenge people to go through and see the upside and what they learned in each of those job jumps and have those as some bullet points and then practice with some friends too. But until you're okay with it and until you don't blame yourself that's going to come through on the interview. And so I think it's important to say, well, you know, I can, I can walk you through each of the companies. This was a mass reduction in force. This company shut down. Here's what I learned along the way. And here's what led me to that. That ties back into taking in the story. Now to go to Raj's point, I want to talk about something that I hear all the time that people compliment me on. That's kind of nice um, is Liz, you have a great network and you're so good at networking. I, okay. But to me, a network is just people I care about and who care about me. And sometimes I meet some of those people at trade shows and I like them. And sometimes I meet other people I don't like. It's not that I don't consider them in my network. It's just, I'm not going to reach out. So don't feel like you have to reach out to everyone, but here's what you want to do. No one ever attains success completely on their own. And if you've been doing the same thing, you know, for the past six to nine months where, hey, I keep applying and nothing's happening, it's time to try something different. Another thing has happened in the past, I would say like five to seven years is all the job postings previously were on like Dice, Career Builder, uh, Monster. And then they, they just took over the market And then they charged up the wazoo for those job postings. And then they changed their format so that it was harder to find people in their system. And then people went to LinkedIn. Now, sorry, LinkedIn, they're kind of doing the same thing. Um, So what you're seeing is a lot of jobs that aren't posted on or or going through the regular uh, ways. And even if a job is posted on LinkedIn, keep in mind the person who is reviewing that is probably an HR recruiter who has to see it if it comes through an applicant tracking system, which sometimes filters things if they don't have the right keywords. So what I would do in a situation like yours, Raja, is lean into my network. And my network is not just people I immediately know or people I know on LinkedIn. I don't know if you're involved in different payments uh, like trade shows and nonprofits, But some that I want to mention um, that that come up with a lot of leads, just if you get involved, are, uh, of course, Electronic Transaction Association, but MAC, Merchant Acquiring Committee, they are actually offering, uh, they have like, um, I think, I don't know that they have job postings, but they're offering any MAC member who got laid off instead of three months, another six months of membership, and they still have their webinars. And then you also, if you if you get on a MAC committee, if you get on a ETA committee or a WNET committee, you're getting involved with people who are still in payments and will have you at top of mind. So the first thing I would say is see where you can get involved in your network. Um, and that might not be MAC or ETA, but there's a lot of people at Merchant Acquiring Committee who, as they're building out you know, compliance products, need that tech side. The second thing I would say is understand how to best utilize the subject matter experts in your network. So I don't know if there's anyone that you've worked with in the past that you really liked, but I would go through your LinkedIn and see who you've worked with in the past who are at companies now, and then reach out to them individually. And especially check to see if those companies are hiring, but even if they're not, reach out to them. 
um, that gives, so if you're involved in the, um, in like Mac or ETA and you're getting on a committee, that gives you an opportunity to give back, but also puts you in front of people. If you're reaching out to people who you know personally and saying, hey, do you know of any jobs that are upcoming? Um, you know, where's uh, that type of thing? That's another thing. The third thing that I'll say is look at um, areas that are growing. I get the Nielsen report and it's been really helpful for me to see what PE companies, what technology companies are moving, what, uh, you know, like seeing uh, MPOS or contactless technology move, but you can kind of see what, I, I know if you don't have access to the Nielsen report, um, but feel free to call me, uh, Raj. Um, you can still do some of that research online and then reach out to those FinTech companies that are growing. Um, I, I have on here, like understand how to best utilize the subject matter experts in your network and create a career strategy. And you may have already done that, Raj, but I'd be happy to set up a call with you after this and see what connections I have too. Keep in mind that um, re most recruiters, even if they don't have a job for you, might know of some other recruiters on the IT side. So I would say reach out to your recruiters, to your initial network, and then start thinking of your other network that your friends, people you've worked with, following up with them and being honest about your situation, saying, hey, I'm flexible, I'm looking, COVID threw a wrench into things, I'm happy to take another contract role, do something part-time. And then also create a strategy so that you're doing things weekly, like look at it as a long-term sales strategy. Whatever you do, put it in an Excel sheet, but say, okay, you know, this week I'm reaching out to these 15 to 20 people in payments, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm no, making down notes in the conversation. So then you can follow up with them in a couple of weeks or a month. Remember what they said, keep that connection going. Um, because finding a good job is all a matter of timing. But I will say I am seeing an uptick in technical roles. So hopefully I understand there's been, uh, there's been a lot of rifts. There's been a lot of acquisitions that resulted in people losing entire departments. Um, but I think we're going to be an upswing and I'm happy to, uh, if you want to PM me after this, get you a list of it recruiters I know as well. And any companies that could be a fit. Um, Raja, does that answer your question? That was a lot of great information. It's um, a and, lot, sorry. <laughs> well, no, I think it was great. And I also want to say that one of the things that Liz is really, really talking about, and I know I, my, um, I think the message I had yesterday is a lot about that too, but I think Liz went to it in so much detail is being active in that job search. By the time it's a job posting, understand. I think that people really believe that a job posting is a job posting that's an opening. And I think as a someone, you know, from the company side, if if I'm looking for somebody, me putting on a job post, job board is literally my very, very, very last you know, last ditch effort for that role. I'm definitely calling my network. I'm definitely going through recruiters. I'm doing all of that long before it ever gets the job post. And sometimes the job post is just, oh, let's just see if there's something else there, but I've already got people who are in second, third, fourth round interviews. So sometimes that job post is just going out there to kind of get a feel for the market, not necessarily because you expect to fill that position that way. So it's super important to, ensure that you've gotten kind of all your bases covered and you're being super, super active. But Liz, we are at 100, at an hour, um, 1.33, so it's kind of, kind of late, but I wanted to know what questions does everybody have? What else can we answer for you guys? Um, you know, Liz has given us so much information and it's so fantastic. I want to say one final yeah. thing. Um, I want to talk about rejection. A yes. lot of people are interviewing and getting rejected either at first, after talking to the recruiter, all the way down to the end. Um, and I deal with this all the time, but I can tell you, I have also interviewed for jobs and been rejected and it hurts. It is so important right now not to take those rejections as you aren't a good fit. It's so important to say, okay, this is, this, like, this isn't a personal thing. There's so many things going on and keep in mind that interviewing committees 
um, are usually comprised of a lot of people and we don't know what's going on in those, in those opinions. So I would just say part of this is rejection. I recognize that's a really easy thing to say, but I will tell you that um, I think I can say this live because Vantiv isn't really around anymore, but I interviewed for a recruiting job with Vantiv and was getting ready to move out to Cincinnati. This was years ago. And then it got put on hold. I didn't know why. I knew all the people on the team. I saw them later. They said, you know, we'll, we'll keep holding. We want to bring you on. And then I heard a year later that I uh, was too bubbly and I wasn't a serious <laughs> enough recruiter. And so, and that like at the time I was like, are you kidding me? That really hurt. That's really personal. That's not accurate. Um, but the point is that wasn't, that wasn't right. Just because someone has an opinion doesn't mean it's right. And just because they reject you for a job doesn't mean you won't be the right fit for a different job in that same company or a similar job in the future. None of this is a reflection of you. It's you are a part of the piece, but the other piece is all the area, the hiring manager, the product, the hiring team, internal politics. So just keep that in mind as you go and, and keep going. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. So Liz, I'm gonna have to keep you here a little bit longer. That's fine. So um, one of the questions here is what strategy would you advise to get the title you want with a new job, i.e. VP? Um, and that's from Genevieve. And that is such a good question because I think um, I'm gonna give you kind of my word of advice just on this side. And I'd love to hear what you have to say about this too, Liz. But I think sometimes that comes down to applying for the right position with whether you're, you know, if you're talking to someone like Liz and you're applying for the right position, making clear to Liz, as well as maybe the consultants that you're working with that you want that level job and even finding and doing a gut check, are you qualified for that job? And if the answer to that is yes, I think that needs to be something that's part of almost that very first interview that you go on that this is what I'm looking for. And that's really, really important to me. And these are the reasons why, and it shouldn't just be about the title but it should be what responsibilities are included in that title. So if you're looking for things like PL responsibility, if you're looking for things like, you know, managing people, this many people, I think it's really important to be extremely clear about that. Um, Liz, what do you think? Well, I wanted to be in a director level position with a Fortune 1000 company before I was 30. And I did that and it was miserable. So I would go back to what you said is what does VP mean to you? Because the other side of this is it could be a, like, what is a VP title? Because at a larger company, the equivalent might be an assistant VP or director. At a smaller company, you know, you might be able to have the flexibility to get that VP title. Or is it more important that you're managing teams? Or is it more important that you're creating strategy? So I would say, yes, understand what that VP title means to you and why you want that. And then also keep um, creating kind of a, a list of things that you have done and update that at least quarterly that fall under that title. So if you get a kind of a reach out from someone, hey, we're interested in this. Oh yeah, let me send you, let me shoot you my accomplishments. And then the third thing is, um, which Genevieve already does a great job of, is giving back while keeping an ear open. Um, a lot of, when I first started recruiting, I got some crap for being friends with my clients or candidates or being uh, too willing to help candidates even if there wasn't money in it for me or whatever. I think in business, we expect if someone's doing something for me, they want something in return. And I can kind of understand that. The upside to that, if you, <laughs> if you are looking for uh, your next step, but you're not quite sure what, you have a somewhat an idea of what that next step is, but you're not quite sure where it's gonna be or how it's gonna look, is get involved with senior people or just people who know what they're doing, SMEs at your company, in the industry, ask how you can help and keep in touch with them. Um, and not just like how are things with business, but ask how their kids or their grandkids are. Just make a connection so that they remember you and then be honest with them when it makes sense about your goals. I had the goal to maybe run my own company for years, but I didn't think I could do it. And if it wasn't for me working with people within WNET or having mentors within the industry, and also people that I could just call and say, I don't know what I'm doing. What should I do next? 
those were the people who opened up the doors for me. And if you're, if you're asking the, the important, the people who know how to get things done at your company, how you can help them, the people who know how to get things done and are key in, in, you know, Mac, ETA, WNET, and then keeping your options open. I, I think that's your choice. I think that's the best you can do, but I would also ask what does the VP title mean to me? And then be looking at VP jobs that are posted online and with what companies are posted and, and, and kind of get an idea. So you're making sure you're building that skill set. I know Genevieve and I know she's building that skill set. Um, <laughs> but in answering everyone, I know we so go into like this, oh, well, if I'm working actively on my job, the next thing I do has to lead to my job offer. And it's not like that. It's like chasing a butterfly. No, I, 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 mean, I think that's great advice. I mean, I think also that, and I think that goes back to the whole being active in your network and talking to a lot of people. I, I can tell you for myself, I don't think I've ever gotten a job from a job post other than when I was 19. I think that was the last time that I got, I'm definitely not 19, but um, I think that's the last time I got a job from a job post. So you're right, reaching out to all the people and understanding what does VP really mean? What does that mean in different companies? And that's so important. Um, and what you know, struggles are they having as a VP? You're interested in getting to that next step you're interested in how their first six months went can you can they tell you about it you yeah. know that type of thing that's that's a fantastic question too so we have what we're going to probably end on this last question um and this is from tom he's our ceo and founder of biller genie but his question is what are some what are do you have any questions that are great to ask during an interview so let's get your top two questions i'll share a couple of mine and then we'll see unless there's any more questions if you guys have questions keep Come and keep those coming, but we're going to uh, try to end here after giving our favorite questions and maybe some ideas for some responses. So go ahead, Liz. Am I, is it the candidate asking the question or the client? It's the client. So what oh. should, yeah, for a client, if someone, if a client's asking you, what should I be asking during an interview and what should we be telling candidates that they should be prepared for? What are some questions people should be prepared for? And great questions you think to ask during an interview. Okay. Um, I think, uh, a good question to ask a candidate. I mean, it is, you know, you can say, why are you interested in this job? But I think a better question is what draws you to our company? Um, because you want to see if they're a good culture fit. I think a good question for a candidate to ask is not just, you don't just want to ask what is the culture, but you want to ask, when people haven't worked out at this company, you know, when there has been turnover, what have usually been some of the reasons so that you can get a good idea of what doesn't work there? I hate to pin it down to just one question. I actually have a list. I, I'm preparing a candidate packet that includes a list of fintech recruiters, sample resumes, links to resume writers, and then, um, uh, and then another list of places where people can plug into the industry, different nonprofits and things like that. But the last thing is a list of interview questions that clients, that, that companies will ask candidates. And it often comes down to, uh, another good one is tell us about, um, tell us about a time that you failed and what happened. And that just is a great leaving one, yeah. it completely open. And what people aren't looking for is the best fail or anything or a great story is they're looking for how you learn. And, um, and another question that I think people should be asking when they are going into a, into a job interview, a candidate would be asking in addition to its turnover is what does success look like? How will I know in one month, three months, six months, if I am, uh, if I am exceeding expectations in this role, and then how long has this role been open in various iterations? Because that will also give you an idea of the decision-making process of the company and kind of just the background in filling the, in finding the position and what, what hole they're looking to fill. That's, those are great. Those are great questions on both sides. Um, I would say one of, I would say my two favorite questions. One is, 
what management style do you respond best to? You know, how do you like to be managed and what management style do you respond best to? And I don't think that these, most of these questions you can see are not right or wrong answers. It's more about getting to know the authentic candidate, getting to understand who they are and why they are and what they're looking for in a, in a position and whether or not they're gonna fit within the company culture. So I like to know what kind of management style is someone used to and does someone perform their optim optimum at. Um, if they tell me, you know, I do, I do really well when someone gives me a structure every single day, every hour, and that's fine. Some people do really, really well with that. I know that that's not necessarily my style. So it's very important to kind of know those things going in so you don't have any surprises once someone is in the role. I would say another one of my favorite questions, just a small story, is just uh, asking people to picture their best friend. Like, who's your best friend? What's their name? Blah, blah, blah. And okay, if that person's sitting right here, give me one word that they would say to describe you. The number of times I've had people say things like, oh my God, yeah, Bob would say I was, I'm a drunk. Oh, Oh, that guy would say I'm lazy. <laughs> and it's just because they get caught off guard. And it's, um, I think it's really important to realize that you're in the interview from the moment that you get out of your car until you get back into your car from that interview. And if it's a phone interview, if anything like that, it's from the moment you pick up the phone all the way until the end. So it's mm -hmm. not okay to treat the receptionist poorly. I know that a lot of times people do that. And I know and um, when I had my own company, my receptionist would write, this person was a jerk, you know, and that's important because how are you treating everybody? How are you treating the people from that moment you walk in? Are, is your phone on silent? You know, understand that literally every single moment from the time that you get out of your car, the time that you pick up the phone call, you are in an interview, um, regardless of whether or not it seems like you're becoming really good friends with that uh, hiring manager. We have one more question. Wow, this is going pretty long. But uh, Kathy said, um, how do you overcome shyness and reaching out and creating an active network? I would say, Kathy, if um, we're going to let Liz answer this too. But for me, I think think it's LinkedIn doesn't require you to be not shy. Um, you can still be shy. You get to be protected by being in a virtual network, um, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's something else. I think, first of all, working with people like Liz who can connect you with the right individuals who are looking for your skill set is really important, and she can help you with that active network. And also, going into LinkedIn and looking at the top companies that you would like to work for and reaching out to people personally, sending messages to people personally and say, hey, I love what you do as an organization. I think that this is really exciting um, and I wanna know what are the skills that I need to be a better fit for long-term positions in this company? And will you let me know the best way to know when you guys have openings? What are some other ways you could tell someone to get over shyness, Liz? Okay, well, I feel like the perfect person to answer that because I uh, was incredibly shy and actually had a really hard time even talking in public or on the calls like this until I did stand up. Um, so I know what it's like to be incredibly shy and go into a trade show and hide in the bathroom crying. Um, there's a couple things that I will say. And one is it is good to reach out on LinkedIn. I like what Garima said. I would do some research on the company outside of LinkedIn, like see if, you know, anyone's done any interviews, uh, video or, you know, article and mention something like that and mention what you like about their company and, um, and do that. However, those are still cold, you know, cold messages. So that's one good thing. The second thing I would do is I would remember, and this goes for everyone, but People are people. Recruiters are people. Hiring managers are people. So if you don't get a response right away, if you don't get a response at all, that might not be because they're ignoring you or they don't think you're a good fit. That might be because they're getting over 100 LinkedIn messages a day, or maybe their family member is sick, or maybe their LinkedIn goes to their personal email. There's like a lot of different things. So I would say being empathetic and then finding something that you can connect with someone on is key. Reaching out to people on personal things that, um, like not personal things, like don't go to their Facebook and say, hey, I like your company <laughs> and I saw you have a dog named Fido. But on <laughs> like, I like this new product. I like this, uh, I like this interview. Here's why I'm interested in working with you guys. Here's what I do. Um, and then I would say the, the third thing, I know I keep going back to this, but get plugged in. If you're a woman in fintech, join WNET or women in payments and start getting, um, they have web, they have a website where you can chat with other members. 
who are also looking, who are hiring managers. Um, if you have, uh, if you can get plugged in with Mac or ETA and so that you're going to like one call a month on whatever committee you're on, but then you can follow up with those other people at their companies. If you see companies that are getting like best place to work and they're in the fintech space, reach out to them, congratulate them on that. Um, but try to, I hate to use the word network, but it's really okay to tell people that are in your industry that you like, hey, I'm in a bad spot. Here's what I need. Do you have any ideas? And then just keep following up with them as you can. Um, that's another thing where I'd be happy to have a call with you to help you kind of create a plan. I'd also be happy to share with you my candidate packet so you can reach out to other recruiters to other hiring managers so you can see, practice those sample interview questions it does come down to being authentic but like grima said you don't want to talk about the times you're drunk it's kind of like being authentic with your grandma in church during the interview process um and i just i, I kind of forgot the question now i'm sorry <laughs> no, I think that was a great answer. And guys, we don't have any more questions. And we've, we were supposed to do 30 minutes. We've gone to 50, which is awesome, because I think it's a lot of great content. Um, you know, Liz, thank you so much for getting on and providing so much information to everybody, you know, from candidates to clients, people looking for the next great client. If you guys have any questions, need something, are looking for the best recruiter in the space, go to Liz, get her information. Um, whether you are someone who runs your company and you're looking to find somebody or you are actually a candidate, like Liz is such a fantastic resource and she really does stand behind the true meaning of networking and friendship and she checks in i mean she's she's just fantastic so please do reach out to her um, if you need anything and you know we hope that this was helpful and uh, we'd like to talk to you guys soon so thanks thank you for having me grima bye thanks. bye